The Birch reduction is a pretty interesting and important reaction in organic chemistry. Just from the name, you can see that it's a reduction reaction, which means that electrons are going to be added to the reactant. The reactant is always an aromatic compound, and the best example of this is benzene. I won't really get into the details of what makes something aromatic, because there's a lot of rules which aren't really relevant here. One of the most classic ways to carry out a reduction is by catalytic hydrogenation, but this generally reduces the molecule all the way down to the alkane and removes all of the double bonds. As you can see though, in the example of the birch reduction, it doesn't remove everything and there's still some double bonds left over. This incomplete reduction is useful and opens up the ability to make new products. To carry out this reaction, we need to use liquid ammonia, which can be quite dangerous, and we also need to use an alkali metal like sodium or lithium. We'll also need a little bit of an alcohol present, and this all must be done under anhydrous conditions, meaning no water. Just as a side note, this is a reaction that's commonly used to make meth. What's interesting though is that when the precursor to make meth is used instead of benzene, the reaction mechanism that it follows is completely different. Unlike pretty much all birch reductions, the ring isn't reduced and another part of the molecule is. In this video, we'll be carrying out the classic birch reduction using just benzene. To be honest, I don't really have a use for the product that I made from the benzene, and the video is more to explore the reaction itself. Anyway, that's enough of the introduction, and we can get started. I started off by adding 17 milliliters of anhydrous ammonia to a cooled round bottom flask. The round bottom flask is cooled by filling the bowl with some dry ice and then pouring in some acetone. To limit the loss of ammonia, we cap it in between additions, and then we start a little bit of stirring. The cap's then removed, and I slowly pour in 1 milliliter of benzene that's dissolved in 1.6 milliliters of anhydrous ethanol. The benzene that's used also has to be pretty dry, so this was done by stirring it overnight in the presence of a drying agent. All the reagents that have been used so far for the experiment have been made in previous videos. Upon the addition, not everything dissolves, so the mixture in the flask becomes opaque. At this point, no reaction has occurred, but we're going to get things started in the next step. This step is the one that will initiate a reaction, and it's the addition of lithium. I added the lithium in small portions of about 0.04 grams each time. After adding the lithium, you can see a blue color form, which quickly takes over everything in the flask. Without going to any real detail, the color is due to solvated electrons when the lithium dissolves into the ammonia. The blue color will slowly fade until it becomes white again. I have to apologize because I somehow lost the footage showing the transition between the blue color and it reverting back to the white. Anyway, I keep repeating this process of adding lithium, waiting for the color to turn back to white, and then adding a bit more. The reaction's a little bit complicated, and I'm not going to go over the mechanism, but if you're interested, I'll provide a link in the description. The overall reaction is shown above, and we can see the benzene is reduced to form 1,4-cyclohexadiene. So what happens first is the lithium dissolves into the ammonia and provides free electrons for the reaction. When it picks up its first electron, it forms an intermediate called the radical anion intermediate. The full charged negative anion then picks up a hydrogen from the ethanol that's in solution. A second electron is then added to the ring to turn the radical into an anion. Then, just like before, the anion attacks another ethanol molecule, pulling its hydrogen and forming the final product. The side product in this reaction is the deprotonated ethanol, which is known as a thoxide. Eventually though, a point will be reached where the blue color does not disappear. After the final addition of lithium, I let it stir for about an hour. After an hour, it's removed from the cold bath and the stopper is removed. I leave it like this stirring at room temperature until all of the liquid ammonia evaporates. When I come back after a few hours, I'm left with a flask coated with a white solid. To this crude mixture, I pour in about 5 milliliters of water. The water will react with some of the water-sensitive side products that are formed. At the end of the reaction, a lot of the white powder that's left over is actually ethoxide, which came from ethanol, and lithium amide, which came from lithium reacting with ammonia. 
When the lithium amide reacts with water, it will form lithium hydroxide, which will dissolve into the water, and ammonia gas, which will just escape. When the ethoxide reacts with the water, it will form ethanol, which will also dissolve into the water. After stirring for a little bit, you can actually see a little bit of a layer forming on top. This is actually our desired product, which is not miscible with water. Once we're pretty sure everything's been quenched, I add it to a separatory funnel. Just for good measure, the flask is washed again with a little bit of water, which is also added to the separatory funnel. Now it's time to extract our desired product from this mixture, and so we add 5 milliliters of diethyl ether. I then shake up the separatory funnel with frequent venting to make sure that no pressure builds up. Once I feel things have been thoroughly mixed, I put it back on the stand and I let the layer separate. The diethyl ether is immiscible with water, so it will also form a layer on top. Our bottom layer containing mostly salts and byproducts is transferred to a flask. The upper layer, consisting of diethyl ether with our product dissolved in it, is added to a different flask. The aqueous solution is then poured back into the separatory funnel so we can extract from it again. It's always good to carry out an extraction a few times because you don't get everything on the first time. So the procedure for this extraction is exactly the same as before. The ether is added, we cap, we shake it, we vent it, and we let the layer separate, and then we drain off each layer separately. So after doing this three times, we're left with a flask containing about 15 milliliters of diethyl ether with our product dissolved in it. A clean separatory funnel is then used, and we pour in our 15 milliliters of diethyl ether. Then on top of this, we pour in 25 milliliters of cold saturated salt solution. Diethyl ether actually dissolves quite a bit of water, and the salt solution helps to dry it. So just like before, we cap, shake, and vent it, let the layer separate, and then the waste aqueous layer is drained into a flask. The now relatively dry ether is poured out of the top of the separatory funnel into a clean round bottom flask. We don't drain it out the bottom because it would pick up some of the water that's left in the stem. To really dry and pull out the last little bit of water, we add a little bit of magnesium sulfate. We swirl it around over the magnesium sulfate until we see that it's dry. You can tell that it's dry when you swirl it around and it appears that there's free floating magnesium sulfate that hasn't clumped together. Generally, the water will make it clump together and when it's free floating, it indicates that it's dry. It's really not super accurate, but when we feel it's pretty dry, it's then filtered through a small little bit of cotton into another clean round bottom flask. The flask and the magnesium salts are washed a few times with a little bit of diethyl ether. This serves to wash out any remaining product that are stuck in the salts and also to clean the funnel a little bit. Anyway now, we should be left with just our product dissolved in diethyl ether. So the next step is pretty simple and it's just a matter of distilling off the ether. I use the distillation setup because it's kind of dangerous to evaporate ether into a closed room. So the ether pretty quickly comes to a boil because it only boils at around 35 C. After the ether is gone, we're left with a little bit of product, but it's not enough to actually distill it. If we tried to, most of it probably wouldn't make it through the distillation apparatus. If I were to distill it, I'd lose a lot of product, but I didn't really care because I really wanted to get the boiling point to characterize it. So the first thing that came over was ether at around 35 degrees Celsius. Then a very small amount of stuff came over at around 75 C, which I assumed to be benzene. After that, I quickly slid down the thermometer so it was practically inside the round bottom flask. I did this to quickly determine the boiling point of what was refluxing in the flask. After I got the reading, I quickly took the flask off heat to limit the loss of the product into the distillation apparatus. This boiling point of about 84C is very close to the theoretical of the 1,4 cyclohexadiene, which is around 82C. Anyway, afterwards we're left with a slightly yellow oil at the bottom. I then transferred it to a small vial for storage. I actually planned to do an NMR on it to characterize it, but I totally forgot. This reaction got a little messy at the distillation step, so the yields are pretty measly 0.35 grams. Like I said before though, I really don't have a use for this product, and this was just an exercise of going over the birch reduction. 
Anyway, that's all I really have to show for the birch reduction for now, so I'll see you on the next one. Again, here's a list of the videos that I'm currently editing and future videos I plan to film. In the videos being edited category, you can vote for the one that you want me to publish next, and in the future video category, you can vote for the one that you want me to film next. Also, if you're feeling generous, please donate to my Patreon account, because with a bigger budget per video, I can do more things. Also, just as some added information to this generic outro, I've actually gone ahead and made a YouTube fan page. When I get my act together, I should be able to set up polls there where people can vote on the next video. Anyway, that's all for now, and I'll see you on the next one.